Um, so I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. I put together psychology, neuroscience, and behavioral economics, and I mix it up. I bring people into my lab, and I try to understand the brain mechanisms that give rise to how people act every day, how they interact, how they make decisions. And so today, I'm going to share with you what we've learned about how people form beliefs, why these beliefs can be quite stubborn, but how change is possible if we understand the human mind, if we understand how people think. So we're going to start by exploring thinking. And the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to do a little experiment with everyone here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you three numbers. And I'm going to ask you to figure out the rule that I use to generate those numbers. But for now, just keep it in your mind, OK? Don't say anything. So my numbers are 2, 4, 6. OK, now I'm going to let you give me three numbers and I will tell you whether those numbers fit my rule or not, and then I will guess, I'll let you guess what the rule is, okay? So I'm going to start with you. Give me three numbers. All right. <clears throat> three, five, and seven. Three, five, and seven. Yes, that fits my rule. Do you want to guess a rule? Uh, adding two to each number. Okay, adding two to each number. No, that's not my rule. Um, you in the middle here? Yeah. Three, six, and nine, yes, that fits my rule. Do you want to guess it? Uh, it is you have the first number and then you add the first number to each consecutive number? Uh, no. It's a good guess, though. We'll do one more and then we'll be done. Someone who puts their hands up, that means they know. I'll let you. The third one, I would let you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, one, two, and three. That fit, he said one, two, and three. That fits my rule. Do you want to guess my rule? Uh, no. Okay. So, my rule was simply escalating numbers. So, 5, 10, 100 would be a yes. Uh, 6, 2, 1 would be a no. But what's the point of this experiment? The point of this experiment is to show you that based on a very limited set of data, we form beliefs and hypotheses in our head, and then the first thing we do is we go out and try to confirm those beliefs by trying to find confirming evidence. So if someone thought my rule was you know, adding one, two numbers, um, they would go out and give an example of that, right? But what you could do is you could give an example that doesn't confirm to your beliefs. So if someone thought, for example, my rule was escalating even numbers, instead of saying 8, 10, 12, they could have said 1, 3, 5, and I would say, Yes, that fits my rule. Then you would know that your belief is wrong and you would get to the truth faster. So this is an example of what's known as a confirmation bias. This example was first shown by Peter Wason in 1960. So Peter was an academic in my own department. He passed away a few years before I joined the university. Now, the reason this experiment is important is not about numbers. The reason it's important is because we all hold a range of beliefs in our head, right? We have beliefs about gender, we have scientific theories, we have beliefs about how should things should work in our industry, about ourselves and our friends and our families and our relationships. And then we go about our day, every single day, trying to strengthen those beliefs, to confirm them by trying to find confirming evidence. And rarely do we try to go out and challenge those beliefs. So what happens when we do encounter an opinion that doesn't fit to what we believe? We wanted to test that in the domain of climate change. We wanted to see whether we can change people's beliefs about climate change by giving them information. Now, I don't only mean those people who are skeptic, but also those that believe that climate change is man-made. Can we change their beliefs as well? So the first thing we did is we asked everyone do you believe in man-made climate change? Do you support the Paris Agreement? And based on their answers, we divided them into the weak believers and the strong believers. Then we asked them to estimate by how much the temperature would rise in the next 100 years. So the weak believers gave a number that was lower than the, the strong believers. Then came the real test. 
we told half of our participants that the scientists have re-evaluated the data and have now concluded that things are actually not as bad as they thought and the temperature would rise by only a very small amount. We told the other half of our participants that the scientists have re-evaluated the data and now conclude that things are much, much worse than they previously thought and the temperature would rise by a very, very large amount. And please, everyone, give us your new estimate. So the question was whether the information we gave people would change their beliefs. And indeed, it did but mostly when the information we gave them fit their original worldview. So when the weak believers heard that the scientists are now saying, actually, we made a mistake and it's, it's not that bad, they moved a lot in that direction. But they didn't budge at all when they heard that the scientists are saying, actually, it's much, much worse than we previously thought. The strong believers did the opposite. So when they heard that the scientists are saying we made a mistake and actually things are not as bad as we thought, they didn't move in that direction, but they moved a lot when they heard that the scientists are saying things are much dire than we originally thought. So when you give people data, they're fast to embrace the data that confirms to what they believe, but will assess counter evidence with a critical eye. And this is another example of the confirmation bias. Now, the confirmation bias is not new. But today, as information is so readily available, we can find evidence to confirm everything that we want, every single opinion that we have, right by the click of the mouse. We will find opinions or evidence or data that will confirm our beliefs. And so this actually is taking groups to extremes, polarizing people instead of bringing them together, as we can see in this experiment. So we wanted to know what goes on inside the human brain when you're encountered with an opinion that doesn't fit your own. So we did an experiment where we brought pairs of individuals into the lab and we asked them to make financial decisions together. Specifically, they had to assess real estate. While they were doing that, we recorded their brain activity in two MRI scanners, but they can interact over the computer. So the way that it works is each person lies down like that. There is a head coil. On the head coil, there's a small mirror. Oops, sorry, go back. There's a small mirror, um, and they can, the mirror projects anything that we want from a computer screen. So we can show them the real estate, we can show them the opinions of the other people, and they can answer using the button box in both hands. What we found was that when two people agreed, each person's brain encoded the information coming from the agreeing partner very well. So what you're looking here is a slice of the brain. If I were to cut your brain like this and look inside, and I'm highlighting all the regions in the brain that was efficiently encoding information from an agreeing partner. As a result, when two people agreed, they became more confident in their original decision. However, when the two disagreed, metaphorically speaking, it looked as if the brain was shutting down and we couldn't find activity that indicated that people were encoding information that was coming from a disagreeing partner. And what happens to people, what happened to people's confidence in their own decision? It didn't change much. There was a slight but non-significant decrease. Interestingly, sometimes we blacked out the computer screen, so they didn't know what the other person was thinking. In those cases, nonetheless, people also became more confident in their own decision. I could just assume that they were thinking, well, the other person is probably agreeing with me, I can't see it, and then they became more confident. So usually people, when they see this, they ask, well, is this true for everyone? Are there individual differences? Well, if you see yourself as highly analytical, as I think a lot of us do, embrace yourself. A study conducted at Yale University by Dan Kahan and colleagues found that people with better math and logic skills are more likely to twist data at will. <laughs> they looked at 1,000 Americans, and the first thing they did is they gave them math questions and logic questions. Based on those tests, they divided them into those with the high skills and those with the low skills. <laughs> then they gave them two sets of data. One set, they said, was looking at whether skin cream was um, treating, was good for rashes, was helping rashes. They said, look at the data, analyze the data, and tell us whether the skin treatment is working. Well, unsurprisingly, those with better math and logic skills did better. Then they gave them another set of data. 
This set of data, they said, was looking at whether gun control laws are reducing crime. Look at the data, analyze the data, and tell us whether the gun control laws are reducing crime. Now, the difference here was that everyone had a very strong opinion about gun control, right? Some people were for and some people were against. And that passionate opinion interfered with their ability to analyze the data. And in fact, those with the better math skills did worse. It seems that people were using their skills not necessarily to reach the most accurate conclusion, but to find fault with the data that they weren't happy with. So the question then is, why have we evolved a brain that is happy to discard perfectly good information when it doesn't fit our views? Well, the brain assesses a new piece of evidence in light of the knowledge it already stores because, on average, that is, in fact, the correct approach. If I were to tell you that I saw a pink elephant flying in the sky, you will assume that I'm lying or delusional, as you should. Right? When a piece of evidence doesn't fit a belief that we hold with confidence, that piece of evidence, on average, is wrong. There are four factors that determine whether a piece of evidence will change your belief. Your current belief, your confidence in that belief, the new piece of evidence, and your confidence in that piece of evidence. And the further away that piece of evidence is from your current belief, the less likely it is to change it. There is one exception, though. When that new piece of evidence doesn't fit what you believe, but it's exactly what you want to believe. Let me give you an example. So a few months before the presidential election, a group of scientists in the UK asked 1,000 Americans to predict who was going to win the presidential election. And they also asked them, who do you want to win? So back in August, half wanted Trump to win and half wanted Clinton to win. But back in August, both, most of both the Trump supporters and the Clinton supporters believed that Clinton was going to win. Then they showed them a new poll, and the poll predicted a Trump victory. And they asked them again, so who do you think is going to win? The question was whether this poll will change their predictions. And indeed it did. But mostly, it changed the opinion of the Trump supporters. They were elated by this new poll, and they said, well, in that case, maybe Trump will win. The Clinton supporters, on the other hand, said, yeah, well, we're not quite sure about this poll. We still think most likely Clinton will win. So when we get a piece of evidence that doesn't fit to what we want to believe, our immediate reaction is this. <laughs> Denial, rationalization, and trying to distance ourselves from the facts. And maybe the best way to distance yourself from the fact is not to expose yourself to the evidence. Take the stock market, for example. Do you know when people check on their stocks just to see how much they're worth, without any intention of making a transaction, just to have a little peek? So this is a study from free behavioral economists, Carlson, Lowenstein, and Seppi. What you see here in black is the S&P 500 over two years, and in gray is the number of times that people logged into their account just to have a peek. So these are not raw numbers. They've corrected for all the obvious confounds, like market volume and willingness to transact. OK, so what do we see? When the market goes up, people are more likely to log into their account. They say, well, if the market has gone up, my value has probably gone up, and they want to get a sniff of the good news. When the market is going down, people are less likely to log into their account. They say, well, the market is going down, I'm probably losing money, and I don't want to know. Now, all this is true as long as negative information can reasonably be avoided. So what you don't see here is what happened in the financial collapse of 2008 when the market went, went down, and that's when people started logging in frantically. But it was a little bit too late. So in other words, we perceive what we want to perceive regardless of the evidence. And apparently, something in my brain and something in Moran's brain made us choose a similar slide. <laughs> Maybe it's an Israeli chip in our brain. Um, now, our mistake is that 
as teachers and educators, parents and mentors, we try to put a clear mirror in front of people, right? We try to say, no, you're wrong and I'm right, and here are all the facts and figures that show that I'm right. And you know what? The picture is going to get uglier and uglier, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the brain will frantically try to distort the image until it gets the information it's happy with. But what will happen if we went along with how our brain works, not against it? The biases that we have in how we process information have evolved over millions of years. They're very hard to change, but we can work with them to make positive change. And let me give you one example. So I already told you that the brain does a much better job at taking information that is coming from an agreeing partner. So what that means is that when trying to convince someone to do something or believe something, maybe we could start by common grounds. So a common belief that we have, or a common motivation. For example, some parents refuse to vaccinate their kids because of the alleged link to autism. Now, the, the uh, normal approach of health professionals is to say, well, look, here's all the data and all the, the figures suggesting that there isn't a link. But studies show that this doesn't work very well. The parents who refuse to vaccinate their kids usually have strong opinions, and uh, showing them the data doesn't really change anything. So then a group of researchers at UCLA said, well, can we get to the same outcome, which is to get parents to vaccinate their kids without discussing and focusing on what we disagree on? Can we focus on what we agree on? And so they highlighted the fact that these vaccines protect kids from deadly diseases, from mumps, rubella, measles. It's not something that the parents disagreed on, but it seemed to have been forgotten in the heat of the debate. And by focusing on this common belief that they have, and also a common motive, because both the parents and the health professionals wanted the kids to be healthy, they were able to change parents' intentions to vaccinate the kids three times as much than the normal approach. But of course, we can't always find common beliefs and motives. What do we do then? Well, I'm out of time, so to find out, you're going to have to look at the <laughs> read the book, and thank you so much.